Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our sixth webinar in the Ultimate House Hacking Guide in Colorado. So today we're going to be talking about the House Hack Stack. Now, this is a very important concept when it comes to building long-term wealth through house hacking. And so we're not going to be in the specifics of, oh, room by room rental this, room by room rental this, but really looking at house hacking as a financial tool to go out there and over the next five, 10 years, be able to achieve financial freedom and a very high level of net worth, all while using very little money down. So like I said, this is our sixth webinar in here. If you've not seen the other ones, I would recommend you go back and listen to those first because the webinars do build upon each other. But before I get into today's show, I want to give a big thank you and shout out to Blue Magic Water and Sewer, who I yep. know Ben and Jeff, both you guys have used. Uh, tell yeah. us why they were awesome to work with. Yeah, anything, What I know plumbing is a huge scope. Anything you need plumbing wise, reach out to said. Great to work with. Both Jeff and I use them. Highly recommended. Yeah. yeah. And anytime you uh, buy a house or go in a contract house, Always do due diligence. Always get the sewer scope. Sewer scope. Of course, do inspection, do radon. But we're talking about a sponsor here. Definitely do your sewer scope and yeah. check out plumbing. Yes. All right. So today's agenda, we're going to talk about high level what a house hack stack is. Then we're going to actually go through and talk about Jeff White's portfolio. Um, he's been described as the poster child of Denver house hacking. We were at a Bigger Pockets meetup uh, last week, and the fellow agent house hacker was like, oh, yeah. Jeff is legend, so you want to hear Jeff's story on here because what he's done uh, is amazing, but it is completely duplicatable and repeatable by anyone listening to this video or watching this video. So that's the exciting thing about it. It's an amazing story, and Jeff did nothing really unique, nor is he a special human being. Um, I thought you said I'm a poster child. <laughs> <laughs> you just, but you executed. That's the thing. Yes. Like You executed. Uh, Consistently yes. is key. <laughs> <laughs> and they'll talk about the playing the long game with house act because then that's how you you win the game of monopoly all right so as usual we got four great people in the studio today myself is chris lopez and then to my left is ben einspar who's an active house hacker yep. and also envision advisors house hacking expert along with uh, short term short term and medium term rentals ben glad to have you in the studio glad to be here chris and already gave jeff white's introduction jeff gotta be in here i inflated your ego yeah, I'm, uh, um, I'm like up here now, so yes. you might have to bring me down from the clouds. Oh, but, no, uh, I'll, I'll throw a few puns. We'll bring you down. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but glad to have you here uh, you. because Jeff is just a wealth of knowledge. And then last but not least is Troy Howe, who's an amazing lender we've all uh, worked with on our clients, been a key part of our, a lot of our clients' success. And the type of financing he gives you is what has allowed Jeff to do what Jeff has done. So you want to know this guy, Troy. Welcome back. Appreciate it. Thank you for having me. All right, so as always, want to take that 50,000 foot view and talk about that three factor alignment, which is the strategy. What is your strategy? Airbnb, room by room, house hack. What are your goals and what's the market you're in? And we're always wanting to find that sweet spot. That's where the three of those circles overlap and that is the sweet spot we want to focus on. So as we talk about the house hack stack today, please ask questions in the comments. Uh, we will be answering them. All right, so getting into the fun stuff now, what is the house hack stack? Uh, well, this took me a while to like really like understand and appreciate this concept because like, like a lot, as like a lot of people, I got into real estate investing um, and my first property was a house hack. I didn't know what that term was back, you know, uh, geez, like 12 years ago now, but I just looked at, hey, I bought this place, I'm living for free essentially. And then I moved out, hey, I'm making $200 a month. And I was very focused on what's the, the immediate savings or immediate income, which is very important. Like we always want to save money and, you know, we got to be able to pay bills today and tomorrow, but that is saving money. That's not build wealth. And the house hack stack is all about taking that 50,000 foot view and saying, Hey, we need one, two, three, four, five properties. It's those multiple properties that as you stack them is actually what builds your wealth and helps you achieve financial freedom. And so I'm a huge Monopoly fan, probably like most people are. Uh, who wins Monopoly with a one green house? No one. Not me. No. Maybe your daughter? <laughs> no. <laughs> we're, we're, we're playing. It's, 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 she's going down. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Everyone's going down for playing. Um, There's no mercy. You don't win, wow. but you win by having multiple properties. 
now, you know, winning in real estate, real life real estate, is not like Monopoly where there's one winner and three losers, but it's that same concept where multiple properties, multiple times around go, that's how you ultimately achieve success. So we're going to be taking that 50,000 foot view and talking about some of these key wealth building principles and really using Jeff's story and his portfolio to dissect steps from when he bought the property, where he was, to where he is now, both in experience, operating, and of course, numbers. So Jeff, this is something that you've always talked about as you've been building your house hack stack is these four themes that you focus on. Yep. Can you uh, tell us what those are? Yeah. So what's great about house hacking is you get the hands-on education of um, becoming a self-manager while you're living there. So you get the benefits of not only you're going to have to move anyway, so you're moving to the property and during that one year to make Troy happy. So you have to fill yeah. that one year requirement. Yeah. That's what you sign off up for. But in that one year, you'll get all the ed education to become a really self-manager and learn all the stages of how to run the business of uh, whether you're doing rent by room, long-term rentals, short-term, mid-term. You're getting that one year education will be more than all podcasts, books, and um, educational seminars you've been to. All right. And then number two, uh, the cash flow. This is the thing that I always want to look for is basically, can you make cash flow? Um, well, first goal would be to live for free. And then even with the high rates, it's still possible. And then number two, the day you move out, can you make a profit? And I look at profit as more of cash flow than anything else or cash on cash return. And that is definitely possible even at the rates in six and seven percents. You just have to be more creative. And that's where house hacking is the creativity, finding ways to make it work and still cash flow after move out. Yeah. And then depreciation, that's the uh, what is it? non-cash expense where uh, when you do your taxes a year from now, um, or April 15th, for those of us counting, um, you will get this non-cash expense called depreciation. And we don't go into too much on that because I know Chris has plenty of uh, webinars about tax benefits, but basically you can get um, this great write-off for any real estate you own. And when house hacking, you get uh, to get that benefit the year that you're there. And then equity build, you know, if you look at the last 40 years in Denver Metro, you get 5% uh, a year on average, even that includes the 2008 to 2010 decline periods. So if you take the long-term game and put it in perspective, you will calculate or um, get a 5% annualized average return uh, in equity. And then debt pay down every month, you're paying down the principal and making Troy happy because you're living in a year and paying down the loan. Well, your, your tenants are paying down the principal. Technically, yes. Yeah. yeah. So before we, yeah, before we move on, I, I added this slide of the iceberg because I, li I like this as a, a great visual. I'm a visual learner. I like to say cash flow is what everyone talks about with real estate is that's just the tip of the iceberg, but cash flow will not build you wealth. Look at line item three and four. From my personal experience, that's where the true wealth building has come. And that's where the overall debt, like the leveraging debt takes place uh, is in line item three and four, not just cash flow because cash flow will not build you wealth again. The other three, the other three actually will. Yeah, and that's that's such a great uh, metaphor and highlight. There is exactly what you said. Is so like everyone's focused on cash flow, which is very important, but it's not the only thing. All right, so let's talk about tracking and building your house hack stack. So this is uh, we're gonna actually shift over from the slides here in a second to a software called Property Llama, and this is software that we've been building for about two years now and using internally. Um, to actually go out there and do real estate portfolio management and optimization. So it's like a, you know, like a mint.com, personalcapital.com, but for your real estate portfolio. So uh, we're going to go through that, actually go through Jeff's portfolio and talk about step-by-step, -step, hey, here's property one, here's how the current pro portfolio looks, um, and go through some metrics. So anyone go out there and create a free account. If you want to, go to propertylama.com or scan that QR code if you're watching the video and that'll take you to propertylama.com though. Free account, get to plug in your properties, get some really cool analysis on what moves you could make. And here's the best part, no more spreadsheets. All right, so getting into Jeff's house hack here, or Jeff's house hack stack, I should say. 
Uh, give us the broad overview about where your portfolio is now. Yeah. And then we're going to go rewind it and go back to when you were uh, a young, brand new house hacker. Yes. So as of today, it's eight rentals spread all across town. Most of them are west of I-25 and then west or southeast Denver metro area. And yeah, eight rentals, um, all producing cash flow because that's my favorite metric. And that was that is me today. Um, fa- uh, rewind six years prior. And when I first started out, it was just one uh, rental that you could see up there in the, the green little icon there. Um, the one over by the, Edgewater? Yeah, right south of Edgewater. That was the first one. That's where it all started. It was a four unit. Um, and you know, it was the most amazing experience, but also the biggest headaches on top of that. So I had the best education and two full-time jobs while doing it. And, but I learned the most and that's what has allowed me to be consistent and scale a lot easier because I didn't let that get to me. Yep. Uh, but that first one is where it all started. Yeah. And it's kind of hard to see, but if you look at the very bottom left, it looks like a big blob of properties there, Jeff. What, what are those? Yeah, so that, there's three right there. So those, yeah. uh, <laughs> there are three uh, properties literally within like a block of each other. Mm-hmm. And the reason I like that area a lot, um, called you for the fans at home, um, <laughs> is the the house you get uh, quality houses um, in a good price point, and the cash flow still works really yeah. well because you still have a lot to sell when you're attracting prospective tenants. Is you're so close, 15 minutes from Red Rocks, 15 minutes from downtown. Mm-hmm. Close to Art Museum, close to Sloan's Lake, close to all the Mexican and pho restaurants you can imagine. Yep. And it's an awesome place to live. So if you're uh, not, can't see that, he's talking like Southwest Denver, like, you know, North of Hamden, federal area. Yep. Um, yeah, it's, like I said, it is a really sweet spot. I and think, then well. there's seven total house hacks here. Um, and then, but there's eight properties. And we actually sold that first one I just mentioned and bought two. Um, way in that east, that red uh, dot in Aurora, uh, the eastern side of Aurora, and then another one in that little cluster that Ben likes, my little blob area of College View. Uh, so we went from um, seven house hacks, sold one, so we're at six, and then bought two to eight, and that's where we are today. Awesome. All right, so we're gonna come back here and start rewinding the clock a little <laughs> bit. Um, all right, so we are logged into uh, Property Llama right now. <clears throat> And what you see at the top here is Jeff's current portfolio as of today in yep. 2023, his as is portfolio, what he just described. So we're not going to go through every single metric on here. I'm just going to touch on a couple, like, I think really cool things. Um, and keep in mind, this is all stuff we started six years ago. Yep. 2017. Six years ago and all basically using like, what, three to eight percentage down payment, yep. typical house act loans. Or five percent down conventional. Yeah, five percent so, conventional. Yeah. And then and like the one that, the one FHA that was yeah. seven eight percent down. Correct. Okay. Yeah. So so five percent down for for easy math. So total real estate of about five million dollars. Freaking insane, isn't it? Yeah, it blows my mind. I, I yeah. didn't when I put all these in because I don't like look at it every day. Yeah. So it's kind of fun when you input it all. It's like holy cow, that's uh, more than I thought. Well, I think that yeah. something else too. Like I can't remember if this was to you, but we've had a lot of people when they put in the property law, I mean, you know, aggregates everyone's portfolio. Is I mean, you are a real estate millionaire at this point based off of equity in your property. So debt pay down, appreciation, equity. I mean, you're at one million plus in equity. So I guess I'm done. I could just leave right now. Are you? Uh, well, <laughs> I'm kidding. Depends. Yeah, I bet you like cash flow. I love cash flow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so next two numbers here is NOI, which is net operating income. While that's future cash flow, if all your properties were paid off with no mortgages, that's if you bought all these properties and hey Troy, thanks a lot, I paid you off. Go bye bye. Um, you'd be making about three hundred and forty thousand dollars a year in cash flow. That's pretty ridiculous. Yes. Yeah, and it's like. That is an option. I could just pay them all down to zero and say, okay, I'm going to stop the growth phase and just pay them to zero. And that's my, however long it takes me, that's my, my end retirement cash flow goal right there. I, I can live off of that, no problem. Yeah. And that's uh, today's dollars. Like, yeah. That's only going to go up in the future. So that's even more incredible. Yeah. And then annual cash flow. So total cash flow, while he has the expenses plus still the mortgages on there, is you know over $120,000 a year. So, I mean, just some huge numbers here. And this is where, especially for a lot of people buying their first or second property, especially, oh my gosh, 
prices are high, interest rates are high, and the market's all weird right now. It's hard to get that perspective of like, oh, how is this going to lead to wealth? Well, you know, when Jeff Ball's first fourplex, people back there are saying, hey, the market's too hot. Don't buy. It's at the top. It's at the top. It's at the top. They've been saying it every single year, right? Since 2016, right? Yeah. Yeah. I've heard the same thing is like, why would you overpay for a uh, property? It, you know, when I was looking in 2017, it was like, oh, everything's so expensive. You're just going to overpay for a multifamily back then. And I guess maybe they're right relative to 2012. But uh, obviously, they weren't correct when you compare it, compare it to you know today. Yeah, yeah, and that's I mean, generally speaking, real estate prices and rents mm-hmm. go up. Yeah, we're gonna have a couple down years, a couple flat years, but overall they go up. So just you know, let those numbers digest and realize that hey, if you're out there in property zero, property one, property two, and I know the market's not like it was even five years ago. And granted, now like oh, that was amazing back then. Back then, people were saying, oh my gosh, the market's overheated. Don't buy. We're at the top. We're about to crash. So. I say that because this model, this house hacking method, the house hack stack works in every market condition so far that I've seen and that we've modeled. Um, and it's essentially, if you stick to the plan, like I said, going back to you, like, again, sorry to burst your bubble, Jeff, but you're you're nothing special. You just did a house hack every year, uh, but you executed. <laughs> I'm a little hurt. <laughs> sorry, sorry, Jeff's mom. I thought I'm a special sorry, Jeff, snowflake. <laughs> sorry, Jeff's mom. Um, Luke, is so, are we going to say Salika chime in here? No. Yeah, air muffs like a. Uh, <laughs> yeah. you. That, that's just wife. His yeah. Yeah. wife that's been on the journey with him. Um, so, but I'm saying, so no matter where we're coming in, it's that same attitude. This is replicable now. Yeah. Now, it may take a year or two longer or probably two more than what Jeff did, but the same concept, the play, same playbook works, and you'll get, should get similar results like that. All right, so I'm going to scroll down here. I'm scrolling down the screen to actually go to some individual properties. And I don't know if you have the fourplex in here since you sold that. Right? Oh, it's not in there. Yeah, it's no. not. So yeah. mm-hmm. you already kind of talked about the fourplex as your first property yep. you bought. Um, and we talked about prices back when you bought it. It was too hot. What'd you buy it for? Six hundred thirty thousand dollars. Six thirty. What'd you sell it for? Seven hundred and seventy thousand dollars. Okay, so yeah. you did not lose money on it. Correct. Okay. Yeah. So sold that, and now is that reverse ten thirty one? We'll talk about more. And your second property. I think it was this one in North Glen? Yep. Yeah, that's... so talk, talk to us about this and yeah. what it was and where it is now. Yeah, so back then, the, the, that one was purchased 2018, and it was a six-bedroom, three-bath, very simple, uh, up-down style duplex uh, or a house with a mother-in-law for uh, because most realtors won't call it a duplex. They'll just say mother-in-law apartment. And it was three-bed, two-bathroom upstairs. And three bed, one bath downstairs. And back then, uh, Sulek and I lived in the basement uh, with two roommates in the um, that mother in law's apartment, and we rented out the upstairs to a long term tenant, a family. Uh, what we learned is when you have hardwood floors, uh, it's not the uh, best thing when you have a family above you, right. and then you have kids running around and all that. So we switched it um, after we went through that process. We literally switched it up. So we're like, okay, we'll put. The rent where we moved out, and now today it's basically rent by room upstairs with adults and a family downstairs. Oh, I didn't know you flip flopped it. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense. Yeah, so that was you did that after you moved out, uh, or a basically couple, a couple, couple years, years, years later. Okay. Yeah, we just because of you know hardwood th- floors throughout, it was like the simple. Easy way of doing it is just, okay, we'll just get adults up there and then the family will do a long-term rental downstairs. Do you recall roughly like kind of what you bought it for and what yep. it rented? I remember all the, Great. <laughs> I got all the, yeah. So I bought it for 375, 4.9% rate. And what we are renting it for total back then while living there, mind you, was, um, let's see, that was about 3,700 bucks okay. combined. Of uh, all rental income, and now it's worth about five sixty in value, and you're running for about forty five hundred a month yep. total in gross rents. Yep, because nice. of rents have gone up, so we get more. This is crazy about that one. So you know, we rent out the mother in law now. We get more for that mother in law than the upstairs, mm. which kind of nice. blows my mind. Compared to, uh, today, compared to when we rented out the upstairs back in two thousand eighteen. Really? So hmm. wow. mother in law, it's three bed, one bath, not a three bed, two bath. We get more. We get twenty one hundred bucks today for that. Then back then, it upstairs was eighteen fifty. Wow. Yeah. Okay. And usually people think like, ah, mother in laws are like these uh, yeah. 
different apartments. Too, I mean, I'd rather have the kitchen upstairs. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. It like still has that. a full kitchen downstairs yeah, and all that. It's just, bigger, he's bigger. I remember. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, cool. All right. So great one. This is a North Glen property. And now today it's cash flowing up just over about a thousand dollars a month, uh, which is amazing. And that's, and that's with property management. Without. Without. Okay. Yeah. Well, so, Suleika is uh, my secret property manager. She's the boss and she lays down the law and I just hide behind the scenes. Great. <laughs> You're special to me. Uh, I, got, I got a random question. I don't get us all track here, but if I recall, this this had leased solar panels, right? Yes. When you bought it? Yep. What happened with those? Like, that's one assume. Of the, so we you, assume hit, that. you have to assume that and then you just pay a fixed amount. Uh, solar City or Tesla, who owns it now, 85 bucks a month. And then some months, it's nice because you literally get credits back from Excel. So you're still leasing at eighty five dollars yeah. a month. Yeah, and okay. then it, like it does, you do get the savings over time because uh, some months you like get credits and then you pay zero, and then the next month it takes okay. off your bill. Okay. So it's it's has no, no issues with yeah okay. yeah cool. it's um uh, yeah I get the monthly bill and it's fine and it's worked out great. It's just that extra step of assuming the loan yeah or assuming the lease. Yeah, I remember that yeah. was uh yeah a couple yeah. steps. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. All right. So moving on, North Glen, what was the next property here? Was so this it, one, the share uh, Westwood part of Denver. Was it this uh, one? This was right yeah. here, right? On the yeah. cul-de-sac? Yeah. Yeah. Preston Newberry helped me with this one. Thank you, Preston. It was a giant seven bed, three bath. So this one was built in 2001, bought it for uh, 2019, we're at that time period. Bought it for, that one was 495000 the rate back then was 3.75. So the rates were really reasonable back then, pre-COVID. 5% um, conventional because it was a single family, but broken up like a duplex. So you see that little walkout part on the bottom right-hand screen yeah. right there. Yeah. So that one had, this is, my, this is where I got introduced to Section 8. So we had a Section 8 on the bottom. And then so Lake and I moved upstairs into the four bed, two bath, took the master. Because that last house you saw, we actually shared a bathroom with two guys and... Uh, it was a little rough. <laughs> so that's where the new rule became. Let's find, if we're going to do rent by room again, let's find the master bedroom where we can have our own private bathroom. Yeah. And that's, this is the first one where we did it on house hack number three. And we took the master, rent out three bedrooms. What's crazy about this one was it was moving, like built in 2001, moving ready as possible. It was an amazing deal. Yeah. Um, works great in the pictures. Uh, we got a new roof put on and a couple of minor electrical issues, but it was just like probably the easiest rent ready property we've ever dealt with for yeah. sure. Great. And so, uh, today, what are you doing today? How's it performing today? Yeah. So four rent by room, uh, rent by room tenants upstairs and we get about 3,100 bucks, uh, total combined rents for the upstairs tenant. And then downstairs section eight, we get twenty two fifty downstairs. So total is fifty three fifty. Nice. Um, and the mortgage on that guy is about twenty five hundred. Yeah, I mean the annual so. cash flow is about twenty one thousand a year, which is incredible. Yeah, wow. five percent down conventional. Wow. And so yeah. this is one. Uh, gosh, I guess yeah, it was last year, but we did uh, a bigger pockets house hackers yep. uh, oh, yeah. video yeah. tour at this house. So we'll uh, share that link with people because that was a, it's a really cool property to walk. Yeah, yeah. Like it was also I think the longest closing I've ever had. Oh yeah, I remember that was like a three hour closing. Um, then they have a lean on it or something that they didn't. Uh, yeah. it was a little little messy at the closing table. Well, they went to the parking lot and took care of the lean <laughs> apparently or something. It was <laughs> we got the job done. <laughs> um, but you know, hey, the property was great. You know, paid for the closing with yeah. uh, like, okay, why is we here for three hours? No, but you know, long story short, that. Long story short, that is what happens is, yeah, a couple speed bumps along the way. We laugh about it now while you're cashing the check to the bank. Yeah. I mean, all right. So I want to, uh, before we jump to the next property here, actually, is that this one here, Jeff? Yeah, this is. Which one? Where's this one at? This is. So the next one actually was the 10 bedroom. Yeah, that's the next one's the 10 bedroom right one right here. there. Yeah. That's yeah. Okay. Right, yeah. Okay. So before we uh, talk about yeah. this property. Um, I'm going to rewind the clock a little bit, bring in Troy here and you got Mr. Jeff White, who at this point owns a fourplex, owns a house hack in North Glen. That's a pure, a, a pure rental. And he lives in this house we just talked about in off the of Sheridan. And he's saying, Hey, Troy, I want to buy my next house, my next house hack. When he comes to you, 
what what are you looking at there? Like how do you how do you help people replicate what Jeff did going from three yep. properties to four to eight now? Well, it's all uh, the devil in the details, and the details are in the documents. So it's a <laughs> documentation. And uh, show what you're leasing those previous properties out for, what you're going to lease the property you're vacating from to move into the new property, right, for your new primary. And then just make sure all the ratios work out. So all the income information, plug all that in, just make sure it ratios out. And you've got the cash to go for the new place. You're ready to rock and roll. And then you'll love a guy like me because I'm a W-2 employee throughout this whole process. And I was making rental income. So it wasn't like I was just relying on that. You're, too you're, you're my poster child. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> did, you run into, did you run into any major like lending issues throughout? No, uh, looking back, as long as I think on the first to second, they definitely wanted to see a lease of the unit, the, of the four unit we were vacating to help. Offset the ratios. Yeah. Yep. But after that one, I, because we were putting on the taxes, all the rental yeah, income start pulling the tax and then it, it was like a net zero or basically my debt to income went down basically. So right. I wasn't being punished for the prior properties. Percentage. It was anything. It was just qualifying for the new one. Yep. So easy enough. Yeah. yeah. So, so Troy, when, when someone like Jeff comes to you that already has a current portfolio, one of, one of the things when I talk to people is they're worried about their debt to income, they're they're concerned that they won't be able to get their next property. Based on what you said, it's it's fairly easy as long as leases are signed and in place and ready to go. Right. Yep. You from from your perspective. Yep. The combination of the leases good. and the okay. tax returns. Let me and throw this at you, Troy. So the if they get a lease, so if they they're on their house act going from one to two, mm -hmm. but let's say they you know they rented the rooms out or did the Ben style with a little uh, Airbnb and they put on their schedule E, yep. they give you their taxes, but they're right at that threshold and you ask them for a lease of this room or the space they're vacating, but do they, have, and they find their next house, do they have to have that lease signed and executed before closing? It's needed for underwriting. So gotcha. yeah, you'll need it in there to, to, for them to count it and for it to hold water mm -hmm. in the ratios. For underwriting, they have to have that signed. And does that have to be a one-year lease for underwriters? Generally speaking, it does. Okay. Yep. There are little nuances, case by case, yeah. but generally speaking, that's the rule to go with. And again, this is why, as we talk throughout the whole webinar series, is like work with a team that knows the mm -hmm. game, because as you go from zero to one, one to two, two to three, there's all these nuances. And, oh, what about this? What about this? What about this? And you want people that know, like Troy, hey, think about yeah. this now and in two years. Keep this in mind. Yeah, it's it's just so easy to do the pre-approval in advance. It doesn't cost anything. It doesn't cost anything uh, to do. Just a little time and energy to put the information together, the application, and get the documentation in. Yeah, and then we can figure it out. And I do a two-layer pre-approval. I don't just look at it myself. I review it, but we'll actually do a pre-underwrite on it, subject to the property. So it's like a plug-and-play situation. You're so two sets of eyeballs on there. Two right? sets of eyeballs. They ask the harder questions than I do. Yep. A lot of times because they they're not as invested into it. But you know, once you look at the credit the income and the assets and then can calculate everything off that documentation where you're using real world information and get that pre-approval. Then you can shop with confidence to start continuing that house hack stack that you're building out and you can shop and have that pre-approval letter ready to roll uh, for the next property. Nice. So it works out great. Great. All right. So come back to your house hack stack here. Uh, where's this property at Jeff? Yeah, it's just right down the, down the way and right by Hamden Federal, uh, Ben's favorite spot, College View. Yep. And yep. Uh, Stone throw away from all the other ones. Yeah, it's like a bi-level house with an ADU in the back. So it's like a triplex, single family yeah, <laughs> financing, 5% cool <laughs> down, nice. built 1979. Uh, and what you can't see from the picture is that's the bi-level house in the front. The back has a two-car garage and a four-bed, two-bath back there. Front house, what's cool, it's three bed, one bath upstairs, three bed, one bath downstairs. So back when we got it in 2020, right when COVID basically just started, like it was like right after COVID started in June, 2020. And yeah, 5% down conventional. That rate, I like this one, it was 2.75%. So I know I'm a little spoiled in that one. You're, you're <laughs> going to be living with that one. I know, right? <laughs> I'm not selling that one anytime soon. Don't blame me. Uh, and this one's probably our best cash flowing deal because it's, you know, like a, it's so massive. It's 10 bedrooms, four baths total. 
So back then we took the, we did the same thing as the house hack number three. We lived in the master in the back house, the ADU and rent out three bedrooms. And then in the front, we did rented out, um, the whole six bed, two bath to a section eight tenant. And then that's what we, our initial strategy. And it was pretty simple, pretty easy to manage. And cause we already went through it in the last house and it was just an easy transition. Um, there was a little more repair work on this one, had like a bad through line, um, some minor issues, um, with the kitchen and some plumbing stuff, but we took care of it all. And today, how's it performing? Yeah. So you see the cash flow. So this one I really like. So we, that section eight tenant decided to, they didn't need that much space. And they just went from the whole six bed, two bath to the three bed, one bath upstairs. And then we rented out the downstairs separately. And then we no longer do rent by room. This is one where we pivoted, where we, the back house, we don't do rent by room anymore. We switched that to another section eight. Mm. Uh, so, oh, really? Yeah. Two, so two section eights, one non-section eight long-term rental. And yeah, the proof is right there. Like the numbers are fantastic. Um, mm. It's just a great cash flowing property, mostly because of great rates uh, Troy was offering back in uh, 2020. The 2.75, so that definitely helps the returns there, but it's just an amazing property. Well, I mean, right now, too, like it's a $735,000 valuation, but your rents are $6,900 a month. Like it's just yeah. an amazing, like, mm. rent to price ratio. Yeah, exactly. Like, yeah. yeah. Cool. All right. Next property here is which one was Scroll it? up. It was that one. The two houses go up a little more, the one you're showing a little bit higher. Oh, the green that one, one right yeah, there. Yeah, the green one. Yep. Yep. All right, I'll get back to you in a second. All right, so where is this one located around town? So it's literally a block and a half away. You could walk there from that last house we just saw. And the reason I know about this one, it was uh, right at the time when we're approaching our one-year mark because Troy puts all these tough rules in place and uh, you can't just break it. Um, <laughs> we had to wait, but found this one. And what's cool about this one is it's – also qualifies for 5% down conventional because this is still a single family property, but it's a single family with a uh, detached ADU. So 5% down conventional, mm -hmm. but you get in like a detached duplex. That's what's so cool about this one is the front house was four bed, two bath that you see in the picture. And then the back house was a little one bed, one bath, tiny house, 700 square feet. And actually, I went with Ben. Ben, do you remember this place? The prop, the property tour I do. And we yeah. can drop a link to that in the show notes as yeah. well. Yeah. That's so my favorite. This one's cool because I was able to use... Um, first time we've had privacy, <laughs> we took the back house with my wife and I. And we went out the front house um, just in one lease. Um, and also at that time, 2021 now, the rent rates were still really low. And my mortgage on this guy was 2500 and we were able to get 2900 per month uh, in that front house because mm -hmm. it was 4-2. So and come, when I, I remember, your... I specifically remember when I listed this place, but it was like in June of 2021. It had like so much demand. It was like 60 people reaching out, 40 applications, almost like did I price it too low? These people, I had one person bribe me too. It was like, how much money could I get into this place right now? So I was like, uh... That's a little weird question to ask. Uh, we don't take bribes. <laughs> and But it was great time to buy, great time to list for rent. And we found a great tenants. And two of them uh, are still there. It was kind of four guys living together, one lease. Um, so kind of half rent by room, half long term. But one lease and two of them still live there today. And then we rent out the back house. So today it's still the, the front house is rented and the back house we're getting... Um, 1450 for that little back house. And yeah, cash flow is awesome in that one. It's a great performing asset. And it's our oldest building too, built in 1926. Wow. Yeah. All right. Next one. All right. Is that that's the 1031 exchange one? That's 1031 no, exchange. Yeah, that's 1031. And that's the next one. Yeah. Okay. So again, we had to wait one year. Uh, and then this one, this is right before rates creeped up. So April, back in time, let's go back in time to April, 2022. So uh, rates were starting to creep up. They're no longer 3% and the 2% are long gone, but we're able to lock this in at 
And this one's cool because it was just a really nice single family home with like a separate entrance to the basement. But what's great about this is it was just had a lot of characteristics. That's it's a beautiful property, needed basically nothing. We added a bathroom. We did some other improvements in the basement, added a bedroom. So we turned a five bed, two bath to a seven bed, three bath, nice. and then lived in the master again, created a separate entrance for us. So we had like a little studio. And this one's great because we did rent by room throughout. And it's our nicest property. So we had no issues finding amazing tenants. And we still have a majority of those tenants today uh, after we moved out. And it's just, you can see a fantastic cash flow in one, even at a 4% rate, utilizing just the rent by room strategy, Ben. No other, no no uh, Airbnb, no midterm, just straight rent by room. The numbers don't lie, Jeff. Yeah. <laughs> what, $18,000 a year in cash flow? Yeah. $1,500 a month? Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. All right. So this one, then I'll talk about your current house act yeah. and talk about these two rentals you have now. Yeah. So... That is that one. this place, right? Yep. So this it's is like the picture didn't upload. This is in Aurora, right? Yeah. 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 It's right by on the uh, east side of 225 near Fitzsimmons, uh, the hospital area over there, Anschutz. And this one, yeah, we just closed, uh, got married in uh, uh, September, uh, Labor Day weekend of 2022, officially. And our. Friendly Troy here uh, knows about change of life circumstance. So I closed on that house act number six in April 2022. Got married in September. Can I, are people a life allowed? For sure. yeah. yeah, yeah. I didn't uh, get divorced, and I didn't move 50 miles away. So the underwriters are happy if they could prove that you got married. Yeah. Right. Yep. That's a change of life. Exactly. And, so. and something you can get done again with a pre-approval in advance. You write a letter. Yeah. Have the underwriter look at it. They sign off on it. You're good to go with so, your pre-approval. Do you have to get like a marriage certificate to like verify like? Mm. Totally random question. <laughs> I, was thinking, I was thinking that same like, thing. There are some cases where they want to see it. Depends on the underwriter. Mm. You know, worst case, get a marriage certificate mm. to prove it, kind of thing. But yeah, you make a good case. You got yeah. married. It's yeah. a life change for sure. Yeah. So More then ways than one. we uh, yes. <laughs> we utilized another conventional financing, but it was a duplex, so we couldn't do five percent. Right. We had to go up to 15. 15, 15 yeah. Conventional so house. that that was a larger down payment than so what I was used to. that's the largest one you've ever done that? Yes. Per, correct. Percent-wise. Percent-wise, yeah. Because yeah. 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 it was 760000 purchase price. Right. And it was, yeah, a big chunk of money. But I love this deal. My wife loved this deal because it had a four-bed, two-bath each side. All fixed, like had egress windows down there, moving ready as possible. Like nice. probably one of the nicest duplexes I've ever seen from like a rent ready condition. Oh, Most wow. Do. Yeah. It was not like, oh, all deferred maintenance. That's what appealed to me. And um, basically there was enough space to add another bedroom on each side to make it a five, two. Mm. So I was like, oh yeah, total value, value add, a lot of space, yeah. uh, locations, easy to attract tenants. So we filled one side with... Um, uh, a section eight tenant on the other side. And then on our side, we are in the process. We just finished everything. Uh, we're renting out the basement rent by room style, three bed, one bath on our side, separate entrance. And we're upstairs in the two bed, one bath, full privacy, full kitchen, all that. And yeah, all in all, it will cash flow while living there about 2,700 bucks a month. And then we move out, we'll get the upstairs. We'll rent out the whole thing. Basically right. we'll take the wall down that we put up and each side will be section eight and the cash flow will definitely be closer to 800 bucks a month or $10,000 a year. So yeah, that's phenomenal. Why yeah. sec you're so close to Anschutz. Yeah. Why so why still with the section eight versus um, maybe looking for someone that would be not a, not a, not a, not for a furnished traveling nurse, but just like a nursing someone. In the nursing. Yeah. I would say we wanted the guarantee. We like the guarantee, especially if we go into recession in environment, we're possibly going into already. And, uh, we wanted the guaranteed rent, so we didn't have to worry about like a travel nurse or a doctor, or someone like that makes that high income to yep. qualify. Uh, if they lose their job, coming up with twenty six hundred, three thousand bucks a month, you know, in that price range is those tenants that can afford that that make three times the income to rent. Mm -hmm. uh, great, you know, they can be great tenants, but if they lose that job, that income, it's not that easy to just come up with like, oh, here's three. I'll cover the rent until uh, mm -hmm. I get another job because yep. they might take those high income jobs are not plentiful. And it might take a few months to get something else. And Section 8, 
I know on the first, I'll get the direct deposit in my account without having to worry. Can't argue with that. Yeah. No. All right. So we got a few minutes left here. Let's talk about, and we won't go on the details of the 1031, um, but you took that very first property you did. Yep. You sold it and used a 1031 exchange, which is part of the IRS code that allows you to take a property, sell it, and essentially like take the sales proceeds and roll it into new properties, but you don't have to pay taxes. Mm -hmm. They're deferred. So kind of like almost like a 401k. Hey, you can make some moves on here, but you don't have to pay taxes on it today. So very, very powerful and very common uh, technique for real estate investors. Why'd you do it? Yeah. So when we were looking at our portfolio, we do it about every three to six months. We kind of review everything, like where are things at with my wife? Uh, the one that stood out, if you could believe it, was that first one. The first one is always our biggest maintenance headache. Most phone calls, um, whatever reason, it was just hard to attract high quality tenants yeah. and just a recurring headache, even though we got it at a relatively good price for 2017. Uh, and it almost passed the self-sufficiency. We still had to bring 7% down, but it almost got there. Um, but it still wasn't good enough. And that's the difference. We're like, we reevaluate every single three to six months. What's the worst property? Can we do anything about it? And the answer was yes. And actually the funny thing in it, if you scroll up to the picture, the house above it, this house, you can see it looks great in pictures, right? Beautiful, like fresh paint job, little deck right there, nice yard. I remember I- It's a wonderful listing photo. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it's perfect. It gets to the point, but we go, as we're evaluating the, portfolio, we were looking at like, okay, what could we do? And I remember I found this listing. It was literally also in that little blob that Ben mm -hmm. loves. Um, <laughs> it uh, was only like a few blocks away and it was 1999 build. So basically moving ready as possible, all repainted, new roof, uh, immaculate on the inside, like super clean, ready to go. And I remember I, I found it. I was like, oh, let me show it to my wife. And I said, hey, let's, I just want to show you this property just for fun. I wasn't even like necessarily going to think about 1031. She brought it up. She's like, why don't you just get rid of our first property and the get headache property? Buy, yeah, and buy this one. And I was like, oh, I guess I could. And then I just like, oh, 1031 is totally possible. And, but instead of doing traditional way, we did the reverse one. And we went under contract with that before I listed uh, the first property. And because the difference between the purchase price um, and what we sold the first one for, the purchase price of that um, nice house right there, we had to buy two properties yep. because you have to buy the basis or the sales price has to be less than the purchase price. And so we bought that one and that little condo, the Chris Lopez Preston Newberry uh, special over in East Aurora, the three twos. Uh, so we bought two properties and we took our cash flow from our best year with that first one was about 600 bucks a month net after. And that's like not that many expenses just because it was whatever reason it was tough and went from that. And then the first year with those two properties, uh, we went from that six, um, 600 bucks a month or $7,200 a year to over 15,000. Wow. Easily. And you reduced headache and stress. And yeah, I've gotten a number of phone calls I've gotten from those two properties has been three in the last two and a half years. Wow. wow. Yeah. So we're going to shift back to the PowerPoint here in a second, but I want to uh, kind of come back and take a 50,000 foot view again, just portfolio here. Cause we went through a lot. Hey, we went through where is now the story arc of the first property and then where he is now. And you can see here, What's happened throughout the, the journey is a couple of things is from a financial standpoint, Jeff's, you know, finances net worth has built up. So the last property, hey, 15% down. Yeah, it makes sense. Your ability where you can do it, not a big deal. Awesome. Um, and then as you build a more portfolio, no matter how great you think a property is today, you fast forward five years, 10 years, just things change. Like the market changes, your life changes. The property you thought was great. You're like, oh man, that's really not that great of a property anymore. Or whatever reason, just kind of being being the pain in the butt. And you're able to make some moves. And so you're able to continue to scale your portfolio. But as you gain the experience, uh, the knowledge, as you say, and also build up your financial worth, you're able to make different moves and go from just, hey, I got to milk out every dollar from a house act. So they actually go, let me play a little bit more of a, of a finance game. Hey, let me get rid of this headache, go here, optimize the lifestyle a little bit. 
And it's just a perfect story arc for how you can do the house tax stack, build a bunch of cash flow, but also scale your business so you're not a slave to it as you scale it. So, yeah. I mean, congratulations, Jeff. This is awesome. Yeah. yeah. I like a pat on the back. Yeah. <laughs> and for that Thank fact, you. you are special. How about that? <laughs> okay, uh, now I can leave. <laughs> <laughs> no, Salika was throwing some comments in there, so I have to, uh, yeah, yeah, I have to save myself. Um, <laughs> you're special. She says, you're special to me, Jeff. Yes. Thank you, darling. Uh, <laughs> is that the Ben or Salika there? Both. Oh, all right. <laughs> all right, so let's go back here to the, uh, the PowerPoint. Because you got some really key takeaways here. I kind of gave you one of my takeaways, Jeff. And then, I mean, Ben, um, Troy, you guys hop in there as well. Actually, before we hop in your takeaways, let's give a shout out to an amazing CPA that you use. Yes, Donovan. Donovan, if you're listening, thank you so much for uh, doing my taxes. You always go bum beyond and uh, he does my taxes and also Ben's. And yep. he's uh, definitely a guy that we rely on to do taxes well. And he's performed for us every single year. Yep. Yeah. He's been one of our go-to referrals and uh, I've only heard good things. Yeah. So thank you, Donovan. And if you guys need one, especially, I think he's very similar with house hacking as well, right? Like a lot of CPAs and uh, accounting professionals don't know rental properties, even fewer know house hacks, but- if I recall correctly, he's pretty savvy up to speed on house hacks, right? Oh, yeah. He actually does it himself. He rents rooms in his own house. Oh, that's awesome. So he knows exactly how to do it. <laughs> yes. All right. So definitely give uh, Donovan a call there. All right. So, Jeff, walk us through a couple of lessons learned from uh, you building your house hack stack. Yeah. So back my going way back to 2016, when I re that read that book um, about uh, how to build a rental property empire with Mark Ferguson, uh, I was like, oh, I'm going to do uh, buy a two to four unit. I'm going to buy one a year and get 40 units or four, four plex, uh, 10 fourplexes in 10 years and make 500 bucks a month, uh, net net for all properties. So in 10 years, I'll make $5,000 a month. Uh, that so was my goal. clean and simple. I know, right? <laughs> yeah. And uh, obviously that goal started off well and it was good goal, but not the reality of the Denver market. Maybe if I was in a different market, that's realistic because there's more multifamily or better quality. But Denver, what I learned after that first one was that's not the only way to do it. Yep. And what happened from there was I just pivoted and said, okay, I'm going to find houses that I still get the benefits of a multifamily where I could utilize uh, long-term rentals, rent by room, short-term rentals. Uh, but have the flexibility of better financing terms, better mm -hmm. quality housing. And that's where we found single families with mother-in-laws or like ADUs or walkout basements, separate entrances. That was the difference. So we're getting the benefits of a duplex without spending the cost of a duplex. So if we're going to spend, you know, the cost of the average house is 600K here, uh, the average duplex, even if it's exactly the same cost, um, you're paying a premium for that duplex, but not getting the same quality mm -hmm. and probably smaller. So that 600K duplex probably is just a little two bed, one bath each side mm -hmm. versus the 600K house might be a six bed, four bath, really nice quality. Uh, and then just find the right one that works for your model. And that's that was the big pivot we had in year two of our house hack journey. And uh, to jump in here, uh, pivoting, is perfectly okay. I think everyone does it. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of people go, oh, here's a plan. If I don't execute on that plan, I'm a failure. Mm -hmm. No, uh, that's the plan on paper. And then you go have reality and reality says, yeah, well, that's nice, but here's what we're going to do instead. And so pivoting is perfectly fine, acceptable. I think everyone does it. So mm -hmm. yeah, start a plan, execute on there and realize once, you're, once you start executing, you will have to pivot at some point. So it's okay. <laughs> Beat yourself up over it. All right. Self-management is key in the beginning. Yes. So I read a lot of books uh, and I love real estate. I like listening to every, every one of Chris's podcasts I can get my uh, ears on. And it helped me. I remember your podcast back in the day where it's just posted on a website. There wasn't even, there's no YouTube that you were posted on back then. And I was still listening in and I'm st still learning today. I still listen to new stuff, read new books, blogs, uh, post everything. So learning never stops, but the self-management aspect is you don't, you can't learn property management by reading a book. You have to almost throw yourself in a fire uh, to get exposure to screening tenants, how to screen tenants, how to find quality ones, how to deal with conflict, how to um, 
switch it over from the day you live there to the day you move out. Like that transition is a big step because now instead of living there and dealing with everything, you're moved out. So now it's a true investment property. And for Troy, I know that helps with the debt to income ratio. Is that correct? When you move out yep. and you rent out your yep. unit or space. Right. Yeah, exactly. So that's the big change, but self-management allows you to not only become more aware of how to find quality tenants, but if you ever switch to property management, you'll know what to look for. Yep. And as always with property management, uh, make sure you know the rules, make sure you know the federal rules, the uh, your state's rules, in this case, Colorado rules, because there are rules that you want to follow. If you don't, you can get in trouble or fined. So make sure you know the rules. And if you want help on how to self-manage, plus plug in one of our leases, we've got a self-manage and room-by-room -room rental course that Jeff hosted. Basically just took all the stuff he built over the last six years, all the spreadsheets and checklists and SOPs and say, hey, great, here's anything that Jeff White's done. And now here's a video course on how to do it along with a lease. So really, really good course uh, for you guys that want to go out there and self-manage or do room-by-room -room rentals. W-2. Yes. I mean... Troy. <laughs> so, so I got to say, when I talk to you, you know, you guys, the lenders out there, I, I've been self-employed my whole life. And I see these Jeff Whites over here. He's got the, the nice W-2s. And I, I just, I just <laughs> feel like I'm treated so differently. Like, <laughs> who do you like more? Get the right carpets rolled out. <laughs> Jeff, I'm liking you a lot. <laughs> self-employed, you guys, oh no, g give me, give me like 10 years of your life. And there's all these tax returns. And you're like, Oh, Jeff, come in. Here's your hot chocolate. Here's <laughs> yeah. this. Um, what, what's the difference between W? Why do you say keep W2, Jeff? Yeah, simple. Uh, lenders love us. They, yeah. pull out, they lay out the red carpet for us. And each house hack is easier to qualify for if you keep your W2. Because if you do it correctly, going from the first one to the second one, as long as you do the first one right where you're cash flowing, Troy will open the door for you and basically help you qualify, help you qualify for the next one or give you ways to make sure you get pre-approved the next one. And then two to three, three to four, each one's easier to get in a way because you're no longer, um, W2 is just like an assistance and the rental income is like the, uh, the gravy on top basically. Right. So you get the, all the extra gravy, but the W2 is what helps you qualify. But that debt to income ratio, and correct me if I'm wrong here, the debt to income ratio goes down each year if you're cash flowing from the house you're leaving those, into yep, the next one. properties correctly. Exactly. Yeah. So it's easier to qualify in a way yeah. for your next, as long as you're not buying, you know, unless you're assuming you're buying like similar price points and all that, and your W2 is sure. about the same income. Yep. Yeah. Yep. It helps. Yeah. If, if it can support itself, then you're free to get that next house and qualify like you didn't even have the rental properties in a lot of respects yeah because they're washing themselves out from a debt to income ratio so that w2 income works towards qualifying on its own more yeah. or less for the new property yeah but we still love self-employed we're not <laughs> totally shunned we just need to dig a little deeper and have to have some tax returns and depend upon how creative your cpa was how much income we can count towards qualifying. Yeah. No, I, I'm, I'm being totally exaggerated here. <laughs> yeah. Like, it was just like, boy, and that's nothing against you, Troy. That's just lending in general. I, but but yep. Jeff's point, and keep it up to you as long as possible. Uh, it's very worthwhile to. And before you quit that W-2, talk to your lender. Um, to say, hey, I'm thinking about changing careers here, going from W-2 to 1099. But talk to Troy or your lender first, because he or she will guide you and yeah, and see what that. that's going to look like and see what that change may do yeah. before you make the change, yeah. before you pull the plug on the W-2. <laughs> All right. So this is, a, I mean, a simple one. Um, keep lifestyle simple as you build wealth. Yep. I feel like that's one of those things where it's easy to say. Yeah. And I've been there where I've had, uh, you know, lifestyle inflation. Yeah. I've seen other people do it. So it's like simple, but hard to execute. Yeah, I guess this point four and five here are kind of tied together. So when you hit the four house hacks, you kind of get a, like an income snowball where it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And you see like an inflection point where now, instead of just making, ah, I'm making a thousand bucks for all my properties, you start seeing like real passive, semi-passive cash flow, And that's when I noticed on my personal journey, that fourth house hack, it was like, I'm living for free and I'm making like 3000 bucks a month from my prior ones. So I'm like, holy cow, I'll get three. If I lost my job tomorrow, um, I could still live without having to go on unemployment or worrying about like get my next job i could actually um still live you know not necessarily well but i could just get enough to survive and that's the inflection point and keep lifestyle as simple as wealth builds that point is basically keep your expenses kind of flat line while you're doing this of course not sacrifice everything 
but each one you get, uh, if you're cash flowing, it speeds the income snowball, it keeps growing, so you qualify for the next one faster. And then the third one faster and the fourth one faster. So that's the big difference. But if your expenses go up as you start making more, then it's going to take you longer to go to the next one. Yep. So if you keep your expenses kind of flat, still enjoy yourself, go on vacations, have fun, go to birthday parties, travel around the world, but don't go too crazy because it's not so much the first, second, or third one. It's the fourth, fifth, sixth one, or four. If you get to four, I think that's when huge difference for all of us. Well, it's getting four. It's also being patient. Yeah. Not rush. That's four years. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's not get rich quick um, by any means. And four years is still a relatively short window in real estate. Yeah. Um, a really kind of like easy way to win in real estate is buy something and hold on to it for a while yeah. and you will make, you will make money. Um, and four is realistic. I yes. mean, if you think about it, it's just four years of your life. And even if you don't want a house hack anymore, you're like, okay, well I'm living for free now. I'm making 3000 bucks a month. And then you could just be a long-term buy and hold investor and just live at the fourth house and be totally content and pay off all the other mortgages. And then that's fine too. So there's a lot of options uh, with the past, but I think if you hit the four, that's very realistic for majority of listeners. So uh, good question here from Jamal. How do you, uh, how much do you guys suggest saving for each house act, down payment, closing cost, et cetera? I can, uh, I mean, my, my rule of thumb is, hey, it's easy to calculate down payment. Hey, 5% down and, you know, look at your old one and say, hey, $5,000, $10,000 in closing costs. Yep. Yep. So I would say probably 5% down plus 10K for some closing costs and some like, you know, there's usually, there's usually a couple dollars worth of like stuff you have to do once you move in the property. That, I'm also a big fan of making sure you uh, have a plan or some cash reserves as well. When I was younger, I didn't really care about cash reserves. Now that I'm, I got a wife and kids, I'm, I'm a little more conservative. So I'm like, I'm going to buy a property. I'm going to have the down payment plus closing costs and rent ready costs. Plus I can put some money in the bank. So in case something goes wrong on day three, I don't shoot myself in the foot. So that's my kind of my advice. Yeah. No, I'm very similar. 5% mm -hmm. if you're buying 5% down conventional, because that's all it is for owner occupied, right? Right. Yeah. Yep. That's what we like to see too. Exactly yeah. And then to five to 10K extra for closing costs. And then I would say at least 10K for repairs, improvements and all that, just because if you're utilizing uh Ben's strategies of uh, furnishings and you know, Airbnb, mm -hmm. midterm rentals, oh, yeah. you got furnish a whole place. Uh, furnishings need updated. They yeah. A lot of, a lot of and these. new paint, like yep. you have to make the place shine in pictures, shine mm -hmm. in you know real life. Yep. And so I would say at least 10K for like yeah. repairs and improvements to make it yeah. like be rent ready. Cause most, even though, even that property that we saw that I said, oh, is super rent ready. It still needed like 12K in repairs. So even that most ideal property wasn't perfect. So, I mean, just, uh, you know, if you kind of know what you want to buy, just look at the property, type in your own price point, work back with say 5% down is usually our go to assumption, mm -hmm. 5, 10K with closing costs, rent ready costs. And if you're going to be doing a, a medium term or short term rental, we'll factor in $5,000, $8,000 for, uh, for some additional furnishings. Uh, good comment here from Jeremy. Going back to uh, keep it simple while I become wealthy. So no mink coats and diamond grills. Uh, so yeah, <laughs> save, save that for once you get past property for right? Yeah. Um, so Gabby uh, asked about, say, hey, great session. Thank you, Jeff. Curious as to what vacancy rates you expect on these room-by-room -room rentals. So room-by-room -room rental vacancy rates and how long it takes to usually fill a room-by-room -room vacancy. Yeah, so I do... 30 day notice on the leases for each rent by room vacancy. And then the average that we've experienced, Gabby, was um, I usually put my numbers about uh, 5% vacancy. And I've only really had a one month vacancy between tenants. And that was because the guy that I was going to replace him with didn't even show up for the lease signing appointment. So I took the ad off. That's the only time I've ever taken the ad off, uh, assuming the close. And that was the biggest mistake I, that my lesson learned was don't take your ad down until you uh, have the lease signed and the range of the deal. Exactly. Great so point. that was my month, my only yep. month delay in all um, five years of doing rent by room. Every other time I've had enough time where I could find someone pretty quick. It's really easy to find tenants. So even like, like 30 two, days, two weeks or 30 days. Yeah. Like ideally. Cause you want the best tenants usually are looking 30 to 45 days before they have to move. Mm. 
the last minute lilies look uh five days two days and you know you, you can find some but it's harder then you're like rushing and yeah. you don't want to rush your decision making process so what's the general like vacancy rate? you're going to underwrite a property five bedroom five house okay so kind of standard yeah. long term yep. okay yeah cool yeah it's pretty realistic and usually rent by room tenants they not all of them like oh i'm moving out like the you know on march 31st I'm not going to just tell you that usually they if you have a good relationship with them and they'll give you like 30 day notice yeah yeah cool great all right and then of course we'll make sure we give a, another shout out to troy here at nova home loan so if anyone out there needs help buying their first property or especially their second third fourth or fifth make sure you talk to troy because as you know he knows the stuff he knows the house hacking game mm-hmm. and most importantly he's helped a bunch of our clients go out mm-hmm. there and buy their house hacks also some rental properties as well like he's mm-hmm. an amazing lender so contact Troy, uh, cannot give you a big enough recommendation. And then want to make sure you guys know about our next house act meetup. Um, every single month, uh, Ben is wonderful enough to host one, mm-hmm. uh, alternate between Thursday night, happy hours and uh, early morning coffees on Saturdays. Yep. So got a QR code up here. Next one is on a Saturday for some coffee. So make sure you guys are plugging the house acts. A lot of people come great networking. Um, and just a lot more informal and you kind of get, I don't know, it's, I don't know. I, I always enjoy those casual mm-hmm. meetups to like chat with people mm-hmm. and pick brain, pick brains. It's kind of get some like, you know, especially get some people, get a drink or two or hopped on caffeine. Just get some, you know, you get yeah. some fun, fun conversations going on, some insightful stuff as well. Yes. Uh, Jeff or Chris, I've been doing it for over, well over a year and there isn't one month where I haven't learned something new. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's great. That's great way to end on. All right, guys. Well. Thank you so much for coming out to uh, the webinars out here. Today's webinar, we've enjoyed it. The whole house hacking series has been wonderful. As always, if you need help putting together a business plan to buy your first property, your next property, or you want someone to come review your house hack stack, like we did with Jeff, we can do that through Property Llama. Hop on a Google Zoom with you or Google Call if you're happy to do that. Make sure you schedule a free consultation with us. Go to the website or scan the QR code there. We're always happy to chat with you. Um, so any questions out there, let us know. Don't hesitate. We love doing this. It's our careers. It's our professions. Uh, we're always excited to talk to people and always honored during people's business, help them along their house hacking journey. So everyone out there listening and watching, thank you. And throughout this whole series, Troy, thank you. Jeff, thank you. Ben, thank you. You guys don't see Jules. She's behind the scenes right now. She's done a tremendous amount as well. So thank you, Jules. Thank you, thank Jules. You, Jules. <laughs> All right, everyone. Have a wonderful day and go out there and add your house hack stack this year. We'll see you soon.